Thanks so much for being a part of our fall conference. We thank God for you. And it's not the same, but it's, we're together. Uh, we'd love to see you here in our sanctuary. And we'll look forward to that day very soon. But we are so thankful that you are worshiping God with us from where you are at home or maybe with some friends, family members. And as we have done every year around this time of uh, the calendar, the fall conference gives us the opportunity to think about the world in which we live through the lens of scripture, to think like God and to become more like Christ. And I think, uh, Dr. Ray, I appreciate just the years that you've been with us. Yeah, uh, I think this, this is what the, it's at least the third time, third, may, maybe fourth, the fourth. Yeah, it could be, and uh, we have something in the calendar for the future. I, I, we do. Yeah, so, so I, I'm, I'm grateful you keep inviting me back. Well, thanks for being willing to come back. My, my pleasure. Yeah, we talked a little bit before our evening uh, gathering tonight and talked about some of the things that were on our calendar that came off of our calendar, just like many of you. And we're so glad that this still continued to work out for both of us. Yeah, me too. So the weekend, we're talking about the Bible and current issues. And I think the order of the title is very intentional. So what are your thoughts just off the top when you think about the Bible and the stuff that's going on in our culture right now? Well, we could have, you know, we could have made this conference a whole lot less controversial mm -hmm. than what, what we're, we decided to tackle. Yeah. Um, but we felt like it, it's, it, it's, it's worth our time to tackle the things that the Bible has a lot to say about, but yet a lot of the discussion about things like race and immigration and the political arena, our culture doesn't really have much space for anything about what the Bible teaches on some of this. So it's, uh, we're, getting, we're getting really strong cultural messages that I think run quite different to the way scripture frames and teaches about many of these issues. And there are a whole host of issues that we could have talked about. These three happen to be, I think, the most pressing and the most relevant uh, for today. But I think what we desperately need is to, as we approach these issues as the people of God, to be very careful that we are as, as grounded as carefully in the scripture as we can be. Because uh, we want God's word to frame this discussion for us, to provide a lot of the content, and to provide the measuring stick by which we measure a lot of what we hear from our culture on many of these issues. Yeah. So that's a good reminder to, to have the word of God be the framework or the lens through which we look at the challenges of our culture. And even we've looked a little bit at some of the questions you've already submitted, about a dozen questions so far. Some really good questions, oh, by amazing. the way. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And, really good. And even as you've mentioned, there's the, just the nature of the topics. It's hard not to kind of fall on different sides of the issue. And when we fall on different sides of the issue, whether family members, friends, good friends even, and maybe close family members, it's really easy to experience tension. It is. Uh, and part of, part of the reason for that is because, you know, even though the Bible has a lot to say about all of these issues, people understand the teaching of Scripture a little bit differently yeah. on some of these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, like on, on immigration, the Bible has a lot to say about immigration. The people of God in the Old Testament spent a lot of their years as a migrant people. Mm. Yeah. Okay? And so the Bible has an awful lot to say about it, but how exactly that's relevant today, how you balance that with our, our law of the land, mm. uh, those, are, those are tough questions that the scripture by itself d does not always provide us as clear a consensus mm. as we might like. Okay. And so the reading the scripture on, on some of this mm. is actually a little tricky. Mm. Uh, and so we need to, we need, I think we need to approach each other with grace and with uh, an open mind and, and the freedom to listen mm. to each other before we jump in and jump down somebody's throat. Okay, great. And as, as all of our families know, for moms and dads with kids in school, and we know that, that since March and even continuing through today, things are so totally different from what we've ever experienced before. And I can imagine at Biola, Talbot, all of the graduate schools of Biola, give us a glimpse of what life is like on the campus for you, Dr. Ray. Well, it's a bit like a ghost town, <laughs> to be honest. 
we have a, we, we, most of our students are, are learning remotely. Um, and since Bi Biola, especially at Talbot, we've had so many programs and courses that are online that last spring making the shift to that was not particularly challenging at the graduate level. Mm -hmm. At the undergraduate level, which is more focused on the residential experience, that was a little bit more challenging, but I commend all our faculty made that pivot really nicely. We had about a week to do it. Uh, that's how they spent their spring break, mm. was getting ready to do that. Mm. And the university this, this summer re-outfitted all the classrooms with upgraded Zoom equipment, so it's, it's very professional, and the students, are, I think, are getting a really nice upgraded experience from what they got this spring. Uh, we have about, my guess is, maybe a couple hundred students out of our 6,000 mm. on campus uh, because the, the county and the state allow for students to be in residence if they are training for essential services and the tr their training cannot be done remotely. So our nursing students, some of our science majors that have labs, engineering folks, our clinical psychologists, those are the folks who are meeting on campus. So we have a few students around, not nearly enough. Uh, and I can hardly wait for the day that when, when we can all come back and be together under the same roof, much like I suspect this is the case for your church here. Yeah, so true. So one last question is, God's given you a very strategic and, and wonderful opportunity to be a senior advisor to Dr. Barry Corey, the president of Biola University. And what has that been like in terms of that role and responsibility that God has given to you? Yeah, about three years ago, Dr. Corey approached me and he said, uh, I have a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> and I didn't know exactly what he meant by that. Uh, but this position of advisor to the president for university mission is an advisory role to the president uh, to help ensure Biola's missional fidelity for generations to come. And as, as I'm sure you're aware, the culture is, is throwing lots of different headwinds at us that are challenges that uh, would, would prompt us to compromise on our mission. Uh, and so we have... We have lots of things that we wrestle with, lots of things that uh, in the culture that would like to throw us off the rails, uh, but we are as committed as we've ever been to being biblically faithful uh, for many generations to come. The founders of the university, uh, they, they wanted to be sure that the, that the B in Biola was there for a reason, and it's the, the Bible Institute, which is now Biola University, but we are, we are there primarily, I think, to equip men and women in mind and character to impact the world for the Lord Jesus Christ through their biblically-centered education. Yeah, that's great. Well, let's go ahead and pray together and commit our time uh, to God, that God would give us the kind of mind and the kind of heart that is willing to, to take his word into our lives and to share it with others. Father, thank you for the sons of Issachar who knew the times in which they lived. They understood their culture and they knew exactly what they should do. And Father, we wanna be like them. We wanna be men and women and students that are men and women and students of your truth, that are engaged in our culture, that are impactful and meaningful in our relationships and in our ministries, and so, Father, whether it's in our schools or our jobs or in our neighborhoods, we pray that this weekend would give us a greater understanding of the way that you want us to think and the course that you would like us to lead. And so, Father, we trust in you, and we thank you for Dr. Ray. Thank you for his friendship, for his ministry, and we pray that you would bless him and use him this evening as we listen to your truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan. It is so good to be with all of you. Just delighted to have a chance to be with you. Although I feel a little bit like the, uh, the baseball players do, uh, you know, uh, playing in, in empty stadiums. Uh, but I'm so, I'm so delighted that all of you have, have joined in uh, for this conversation. And please feel free to, to uh, submit your questions. We, tonight and tomorrow morning, we'll get a chance to answer as many of those as we possibly can as the time allows. We wanted to pick three relatively uncontroversial subjects like race and immigration 
in politics and the election. So uh, I'd like to dive in this evening in, into the discussion of race. Uh, I've entitled this Race in the Church in 2020. It has been a crazy summer, uh, to say the least. Not only have we been dealing with a global pandemic uh, that uh, earlier this summer we thought we had a, ha had a handle on. Uh, I know this church had planned on being back in sort of full swing in person uh, around the 4th of July, only to find out that the cases of COVID-19 went through the roof uh, and sort of everything that had started to reopen all shut down again uh, and sort of left us scurrying back to square one. And in the midst of all this, uh, Race erupted throughout the country, and, and actually the, the repercussions were felt around the world in ways that we didn't see coming. Uh, with the tragic and senseless death of George Floyd, it sparked a, a tipping point for many people in our culture. And there were protests, some of which turned violent, uh, all over the country as pe people came together like we, we, like we haven't seen in a really long time. Uh, to protest the, uh, the issues around race that had to do with the death of George Floyd. And churches got involved in this. Many churches that had stayed silent uh, no longer found that they could do so. And churches, I think, were increasingly wrestling with how do we do this? How do we approach the discussion of race in a way that is honoring to God, consistent with Scripture, and yet obeys the biblical mandate, as, as Micah puts it in Micah 6, 8, to seek, to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. It challenged, I think, many of our churches in new ways and with a sense of urgency that we hadn't felt before. And so I I'd like to talk a little bit about how our churches should approach the issues of race and racial reconciliation, particularly now, in the aftermath of the George Floyd and the other episodes that have sparked protests around the country. And I am, I am totally committed to setting this within the framework of the biblical teaching on race and ethnicity. And thankfully, the Bible actually has a lot to say about this. Uh, and we'll st what I'd like to do first is set a framework for it biblically and theologically. And then talk a little bit about some of the contro really controversial subjects around this area of race. And then conclude with some discussion about now in the church, what are some things that we can do now practically today to contribute and to be part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. So let's start where we should in the scripture, biblically and theologically. Right. Now, I know that uh, sort of in, uh, amidst the discussion of race, we hear a lot of discussion about diversity as well. And I'm sure in many of your organizations that you work in, there's a lot of talk about diversity. Uh, in most universities and schools across the country, there's increasing discussion about diversity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to collapse those two together and some of the comments I'll have to say about race will also apply to the discussion, more general discussion about diversity that we have in many of our organizations. So starting at the very beginning, and I think this is an appropriate place to start, and this is, I think, the foundational biblical truth that governs, that ought to govern our view of race. Uh, and that is that all human beings, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, religion, what, whatever else you have in mind, are made in the image of God, giving all human beings intrinsic value. That means they have value in and of themselves regardless of what they contribute or don't contribute. And they have a high status as God's representatives on earth. In my view, the image of God is not about how we function in, in any specific way, but more about our status before God. As Psalm 8 points out, what is man that thou take notice of him? But you have made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and majesty. And an image in the ancient world was a visible representative of the king. 
that he would put in various places around his kingdom in order to remind people of who they were to be uh, in subjection to. And likewise, I think human beings function in that way as a, as, as, as a, as a representative of God in the world. And it's more, it's, it's I think fundamentally a, a status symbol that human beings are of in, intrinsic, infinite value because they are made in God's image. Now, to, we, could, we could go on for a long time about that. But um, regardless of socioeconomic class, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, uh, any, any other ism that you can think of, human beings, all human beings, have intrinsic value because their status has been granted to them by virtue of being made in the image of God. Now, you may, you may recognize that most of the, of the history of the Old Testament was centered around a, a eth, an ethnically homogeneous people, the Jews, the nation of Israel. God in Genesis 12 chose the nation of Israel to be his chosen people. Uh, and as we'll see next time, uh, they, they were designed to be in one place for most of their history, but ended up being a people on the move for a lot of their history. In Genesis 12, we, we see the reason why God called Israel to be his chosen people. Beginning in verse 2, it said, I will make you, the children of Abram, into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So even though the God's covenant with Abraham was made to a, an ethnically homogeneous nation, the purpose for that was that all of the peoples of the world would be blessed through the seed of Abraham, who the New Testament tells us was the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when the prophets come along and envision God's kingdom coming in its fullness, the kingdom is very diverse and very inclusive, though some of the prophets' kingdom messages are aimed at the nation of Israel alone and speak of Israel's restoration as a nation. But that, again, reflects the God's covenant with Abraham that all of the world, all the peoples of the world will be blessed through the nation of Israel. Many other passages that the prophets describe emphasize the inclusion of all peoples when the kingdom comes in its fullness. For example, in Isaiah chapter 2, one of the great visions of God's kingdom, says this is what Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. This is a vision of what, what will take place when the Lord returns to bring his kingdom in its fullness. It will be exalted among the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will say, will come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. It will be exalted among the hills and all nations will stream to it. Okay? Similarly, in, the, in Isaiah 42, one of the great, what's called the servant songs of Isaiah, some of the great messianic prophecies uh, of the book of Isaiah. Notice that the servant of Yahweh, who is the Messiah, Jesus, will come to all nations. Here's my servant whom I uphold. My chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations, plural. In faith, then in verse 3, in faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on the earth. Then in verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will, keep, I will keep you and make you a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles which is fulfilled in the Gentiles, refer to non-Jewish people, all of the nations surrounding Israel. It will be a light to the nations in Isaiah 49, verse 6. 
so that I will also make you a light to the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. When God's kingdom comes in its fullness, it was is to be for all of the nations, all the peoples of the world. Throughout the Gospels, for example, uh, this is where we get to the diversity in the early church and the Gospels. Gentiles, interestingly, Gentiles, non-Jews, are routinely singled out as believing the message of Jesus, while the Jews, for the most part, as a nation, rejected him. You see as well, in, in the Gospels, the model for Love of neighbor is not the Jewish person, but it's the Samaritan, the hated half-breed Samaritan, which suggests that our neighbor love includes at least those who are ethnically different from ourselves. The Great Commission in Matthew 28 mandates that the church go into all the world and Jesus promised the power of the Spirit to enable the church to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, encompassing all peoples. The initial phase of that fulfillment of the kingdom comes in Acts chapter 2. Listen to what, what, how this is described in, in Acts chapter 2. This is on the day of, of Pentecost, uh, beginning in verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem... God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, which was the speaking in tongues by the apostles, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard his own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, all over the world. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. A very vivid imagery of that, that the initial emphasis on the kingdom coming, that Jesus and the apostles bringing the kingdom was for all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, or anything else. Now, the book of Ephesians takes up, I think, what I would call in the ancient world, the mother of all racial disputes. Because Jews and Gentiles couldn't stand each other. In fact, it was, it was routine for Jews to consider Gentiles to be beneath them and not worthy of being included among the people of God. But notice how Paul resolves the Jew-Gentile racial conflict by appealing to the cross. It says in, verse, in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made the two groups one, Jews and Gentiles. Talk about racial, that's racial reconciliation on steroids. And he has, and the, has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Consequently, in verse 19, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens. Remember, these were people who couldn't stand each other for centuries. But you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. And in verse 22, and in him you two are being built together into a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Racial reconciliation done by a theology of the cross and resurrection of Jesus. Right, now, to sum it up, in the New Testament at least, in the, the book of Revelation has this wonderful vision of what the kingdom will be like when Jesus returns and brings his kingdom in its fullness. This is in Revelation chapter 5. This is beginning in, in verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, You, the Lamb of God, are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain 
and the blood and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Let me say that again. You purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. So both at the very beginning of God's story in Genesis 1, of all human beings made in the image of God and having intrinsic value, to the very end at the book of Revelation, where all races, all tongues, all peoples will be included in the, the realm of God's kingdom when it comes in its fullness. A beautiful picture of the diversity that exists within God's kingdom. So as a result, it would seem to me that at the least, we ought to be theologically attuned to the notion that, there, that, that all of us are equal before God, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity. All of us have as our primary identity who we are as the people of God redeemed by the cross of Christ. Now, our ethnic identity still matters, but our primary identity is that of a child of God, a man or a woman of God, redeemed by the cross and, and reconciled to our brother and sisters often who, who were far away from God, but now have been brought near. Now, I think with that sort of as a theological backdrop, let me, let me tackle some of the specific things that we, we talk about when, when it comes to race and, and diversity um, just in, in general. Okay? Now, this may be, you know, this may be relevant to your, org to your organization that you're in, uh, it is, it's very relevant, I think, for college students who are going to places with lots of diverse uh, students who they interact with. But we, we, I think we often assume that diversity, racial and ethnic diversity by itself, is intrinsically a good thing. And I would suggest that just, be, just, just, as, just as a symphony has a diversity of notes... Just having a diversity of notes doesn't necessarily make for a symphony. If you've ever listened to an orchestra warm up before the concert, that's hardly a symphony. In fact, just a diversity of notes can just as easily be a cacophony as it can be a symphony. And so the diversity has to be appreciated and has to be dealt with, I think, within these kind of biblical parameters that we're referring to. But things, I think a couple things that make diversity a good thing are the different perspectives that it brings uh, from people from other cultures, other backgrounds, other languages. Uh, they help us avoid what, uh, Dan, you'll appreciate this, from our, our mutual mentor at Dallas Seminary, Dr. Howard Hendricks used to say uh, that this, this prevents us from having what he called a hardening of the categories which he described, I think, as much more lethal than hardening of the arteries. Um, we tend, it, it enables us to take off some of our cultural blinders. Uh, now, of course, there, there, are, there are moral values. God's moral values transcend culture. They transcend time. The application of those might look a little different in different cultures. Uh, so we're not talking about relativism here, but, but an appreciation of some of the other things that other cultures bring to the table for us. Second, we live in, we live in a global society. That's, that's been true for a long time. Uh, my part of my job, I teach ethics in the business school at Biola, and part of my job is to equip students to, to be able to deal with a, a very diverse world and a global economy that they're going to be dealing with. Uh, and then it seems to me many of the organizations that you work in, I suspect, make the argument that racial and ethnic diversity can be in your organization's self-interest because it enables your organization to reach out to other cultures and other potential customers, other potential clients, and other potential employees. Uh, that may, that, that is, lots of empirical studies have shown benefit our organizations and make them more responsive to some of these other cultures. Now, 
Let me hit, let me just tackle really brief. I just want to mention a couple of very controversial subjects when it comes to the matter, these matters of race and ethnicity. The first one is a, is a very controversial notion. Uh, and as a, as a white person, I've had to wrestle with this in, in, in significant degrees myself. But we hear a lot, there's a lot of discussion today in the culture today around race. Uh, the term, we use the term white privilege. And what, what, I, what we mean by that is, is often very tricky to pin down. Okay? I have a, a very close friend. Uh, he's a pastor. He's a graduate of our apologetics program at Biola. And he's a pastor in, the, in basically in the outskirts of Detroit. It's a, it's a multi-ethnic congregation that actually was planted by a white person in a largely African-American neighborhood and has become a multi-ethnic uh, congregation. And I asked him one time, uh, I said, tell me how you understand this term, white privilege. And he said, well, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't mean that just because you're white, you mean, it means you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth uh, and sort of have this, this sort of you know, street of gold that you can walk on to success. I, I, he said, it means it's a lot more subtle than that. Uh, so I asked him, I said, so tell me, uh, tell me, have you ever been stopped by the police for no apparent reason? And it was interesting. He just laughed out loud. And he said, I don't know of any black man who has not been stopped by the police for no apparent reason. He's actually been stopped in his own neighborhood because the police didn't actually think he belonged there. And he, 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 he recited a, a very interesting scenario. He said, not long ago, I was getting ready about 10 o'clock and I was running, getting ready to go out to the grocery store. And he said, I put on a hoodie sweatshirt and then I thought to myself, you know, maybe I shouldn't be wearing this. Maybe I ought to change clothes. I would, I would, if, when I go out to the grocery store, I don't ever think about what I wear to the store. It never occurs to me that the police will pull me over for no apparent reason. Here's where it really came, came home to me. Chris said, you know, for, for most white families, and this, this may be true in a largely Asian community as well, uh, but most white families, when you talk about having the talk with your kids, everybody knows what that's about. That's about sex. But for a black family, having the talk with their kids has nothing to do with sex and sexuality. The talk refers to how you react when you get pulled over by the police. And I thought, you know, that never would have occurred to me. And I think, that, I think this is, in large part, I think what is meant by the term white privilege is that, is that things are, that the, the things that are the normative experience for the majority culture are not that way for people who are in the minority. And things that I never have to think about, you might have to think about as Asian, or the Latino person might have to think about as a Hispanic, or an African American might have to think about by virtue of being black. Now, I, I suspect that for, for many of us, the term privilege has a lot, needs a lot of nuancing to it. And I think I would suggest that to equate privilege with any one specific race or ethnicity is very problematic because, for one, I think it, it, has, it runs the risk of being insulting to people and stereotyping, you know, based on race and ethnicity. Whereas, I think, you know, socioeconomic class is, I think, a much better indicator of, uh, of what kind of opportunities that a person has. So I just want to be really careful about this notion of white privilege, white normativity, that we understand what it means, then we take care to define it. Um, sort of related to that, oops, sorry, but I want to go back. Sort of related to that has to do with the, I think the discussion of this whole, the whole Black Lives Matter. Did I not, I, okay, I did go back, I didn't go back. Um, so the whole, the whole Black Lives Matter subject, I think, is another very controversial subject. And I think 
again, my, my Detroit area pastor has been some very helpful guidance on this. Because I think we can affirm that black lives matter. And I think we all should do that. But the organization Black Lives Matter is something very different. The organization stands for several things that are completely antithetical to biblical teaching. For one, the organization stands for a few, and if you look on its website under what we believe, uh, it's, 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 plain, it's, it's very plain. But uh, they, they stand for very liberal abortion rights, which I think violates our view of the sanctity of life. Uh, they stand for... Um, uh, a, a definition of marriage and sexuality that I think is highly problematic from a biblical teaching. Uh, their desire, they state that their desire is to dismantle the, the traditional, um, what they call cisgender family, the traditional straight, traditional family. Um, I'd like, to, I'd like to, to, to also affirm that unborn black children matter and that Black families matter, and the, the notion of giving black children a father and a mother as their best shot at a, at a healthy upbringing uh, is something that I think the Bible teaches and supports. Uh, now, the other thing that I think is very controversial is the notion that racism is part of, a, of, of our system. Not only, is there, there are not only can individuals experience racial prejudice, uh, which I think, you know, regardless of race, anybody is vulnerable to that. But there, there are things about race, I think, that are systemic, that are baked into our system. And this comes from my, own, from my own understanding of the doctrine of sin. That sin starts in our hearts individually, but miserable, wretched, depraved sinners make laws, and they create institutions. And we should expect that some of those institutions that are created by the laws that sinners write and make should also be infected with sin. And therefore, I think it's not only individual hearts that are impacted by sin, but it's also our social structures and some of our institutions that are also impacted by sin. My own view of sin is that it is pervasive and universal, which I think is what Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 3. And so we would expect that it would infect virtually everything which is the reason that all creation is groaning for its redemption today. Now, let me, let me, go, let me go on here just for a moment about um, how, how we deal with this in the local church today. How should we approach matters of race and ethnicity and justice today in the church? Okay, for one, I think we need to be really clear that the Bible emphasizes the notion of justice and compassion, particularly for the poor and marginalized among us. For it is Jesus refers to the least among us. Let me cite a couple passages of scripture on this where I think the Bible is just crystal, crystal clear about this. If you have a, if you have a Bible with you, turn to, a, it's in Jeremiah 22, where I think the Bible speaks as clearly to this here as in, in any place. In Jeremiah 22, beginning in verse, uh, let's see, beginning in verse 16, I'm sorry, 15. Does, it's, this, is, this is written to the king of Israel at the time. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar, the prized wood for, for building buildings? Did not your father have food and drink? He did what was right and just, and so all went well with him. And here's the punchline. He defended the cause of the poor and needy. And so all went well with him. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. He defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me? I'm not sure exactly what's meant by that, but I know there's something really closely wrapped up with knowing the Lord in developing a heart for the poor and the marginalized among us. Likewise, Isaiah 58 brings this out so clearly and, and treats it in a little bit more detail. This is in Isaiah, in Isaiah 58, beginning in, in verse 5. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 6. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? 
to loosen the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you, when you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? There's something about true fasting, which was, which was an indication in biblical times of people who were, who were ultra serious about their relationship to God. There's the indicator that you were very serious about your relationship to God was not a religious ritual, but how you responded to the poor and the marginalized among you. This, I think, is what Jesus meant uh, in Matthew 25 when he said, whatever you do to the least of these, you do for me. And this reflects, this is reflected in the wisdom literature as well. In Proverbs, this is in Proverbs 14, 31, who oppresses, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Now, in, in the ministry of Jesus, I want, want to be really clear about this. This, this, is, this is, I think, a remarkable part of the, the Gospels that I think we often miss. There was, there was something about how Jesus identified his mission as the Messiah when he came at his first coming with his outreach to the poor and the marginalized, the least among us. For example... In, in, the, in Luke's gospel, in Jesus' very first public ministry where he announces himself as Messiah. Remember this? He gets up in the temple to give the message for the day. And the scroll that they were reading from just happened to be from Isaiah 61. It says in Luke 4, And, and on the Sabbath day, he went up, went up into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was, hand, was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolls up the scroll and says this incredible punchline, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So there was something about, something that Jesus, Jesus identified his own outreach to the poor and the needy and the marginalized as being central to how he understood his mission as Messiah. Yes, he was coming to the cross. That's true. He was coming to die for our sins. That's all central. But he wanted to make sure that the, the poor and the marginalized, the people who had been taken for granted of and shoved to the margins were also included in the message of the cross and resurrection. Okay, he, he puts this differently in Matthew chapter 11. This, this is, I think, a very striking imagery where Jesus is being questioned by the thoroughly disillusioned disciples of John the Baptist who are seeing their leader in prison. And, it's, and, it, and it goes like this. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his own disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And notice what Jesus says in response to this. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. That was what Jesus chose to identify himself to the disciple of John who were wondering if he was the Messiah who was to come or they should wait for someone else. Now, I think what this suggests is that there is, there is both an individual and a social dimension to God's kingdom. And this, uh, if I could, I could just really briefly give you the big story of the Bible in the next 10 seconds. It's creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, right? The big four chapters of biblical history. The way things ought to be, the way things are, the way things could be, and the way things will be. Now, I don't know about you, but in my own theological education, I got great stuff on these middle two chapters. I got sin and redemption down really well. But I didn't get much about the bookends, <clears throat> about creation and consummation. And what I missed in those bookends 
is the notion that my salvation is not just for my own benefit. My salvation is for the life of the world. And it's, for, it's, it's, big, it's bigger than just about me. And when, when, the, when the prophets prophesy about God's kingdom coming in its fullness, there's both an individual dimension where every knee will bow at the name of Christ. But there's also a social dimension where, where society will function and we will function, our institutions and our relationships will function in the way that God originally intended them. As a result, it seems to me the church has an obligation today not only to preach the gospel and to disciple people and to form them spiritually, but we also have obligations to our communities. We also have obligations to see that God's righteousness it works itself out in our communities in various ways. Now, that doesn't mean politically, though it doesn't, it doesn't exclude that. But here's the, here's the challenge that I put to, to my seminary students at Talbot, you know, most, most of whom are on pastoral staffs. I asked them, I said, if your church closed its doors tomorrow, how long would it take before your community noticed that you were gone? And I got some really interesting looks from my students at that point. And I think what they were thinking, without admitting that I could read their mind, but I think what they were thinking was, you know, if our church closed its doors tomorrow, it might be a really long time before our community took notice. And I said, if that's the case, that's tragic. Because we have because our churches have obligations to be salt and light in our communities and in our relationships and in our workplaces, our neighborhoods, our institutions, to bring change to some of those that reflect God's righteousness. And we have obligations in particular to pursue justice in our communities and to correct injustices when we see them. And to do what we can, both at the individual level and at the structural level, to, to correct injustices as, as best we are able. In fact, in my view, in our culture today, uh, it gives our, our stand for justice on various issues, for example, on, on the unborn, on racial reconciliation, uh, and on, on many other, on human trafficking, for example, other things that are gross injustices in our culture. It actually gives the gospel message credibility. That's especially true in other parts of the world where these injustices are far more pronounced than they are here. Now, when it comes back to race, what I would suggest is that biblically speaking, because sin affects both individuals and institutions. And because redemption is not only for our individual lives, but also for the life of the world. Solutions to racial issues include individual responsibility, the relationships we make, and things about structures and systems. And I would be very careful about any school of thought that reduces the solutions to racial issues to any one of those areas. That if, it's, if it's just about individual responsibility, I think that neglects some other important things. If it's just about systems and structures, I think that neglects some other very important things. Ultimately, of course, the ultimate solution to racial issues is found in the gospel of Christ. And the transformation that starts in an individual's heart and then as we follow Christ faithfully and give attention to the, 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 the community and the social aspects of our faith and of God's kingdom, we not only we fulfill the Great Commission not only by making disciples, but also by teaching people to observe everything Jesus has commanded us, which is the mandate for both evangelism and discipleship and the mandate to impact our communities to reflect God's righteousness. So there, I think, you know, if, if we had a whole semester, we could go into a lot more depth on this, but I hope that's helpful just in giving you some things to think about, but also to give you a theological framing for how we ought to view
some of these issues of race and ethnicity. Uh, so let me just let me remind us again, just as I close off this part, what we saw in, in Revelation chapter 5, that when the kingdom comes in all of its fullness, with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation, and made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God where they will reign on the earth. Amen? Let me, let, me, let me pray for us in this regard. Lord, thank you for your word that speaks so clearly about this. Lord, thank you for the attention that we're paying to issues of race and ethnicity and reconciliation today. Lord, we pray that you would give us meaningful relationships with, with men and women from other races, other ethnicities, Bring some of these people into our lives so that we can, so that we can learn and gain wisdom and, and learn a little bit more about the rich tapestry of diversity that you have in your kingdom. Lord, we're grateful for all of that in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now I think we're going to take some questions. And I will, I will wait for Dan to, uh, to, mod, to moderate those for us. I hope, Dan, I hope that's reasonably helpful as an introduction to this. There's a lot more that could be said about it. Hopefully some of it will come out in yeah, some, of the, some of the questions. And actually, we're having some connectivity issues here with the questions. Alex, do you see yours up there? Or, or yours coming up? Why don't you come on up, Alex? Why don't you, go, you can go to your mic. Why don't you go to your mic? Yeah. So as a follow-up, you know, one of the questions that came up was, you know, just how today the church, the whole thought about the segregated hour, 11 o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning, Sundays, and how the body of Christ is largely an ethnic-driven, you know, community, very much like ours, which is largely... Asian American. So, right. what's how do we wrestle yeah. with that? That's a, that's that's a great question, Dan. And I, you know, I don't 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 hear me as suggesting that all churches have to be ethnically mixed, because I don't think the Bible mandates that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a lot to learn mm -hmm. from people from other cultures, um, and I think they have some things to learn from us mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I think it, uh, it, it, it's understandable why churches are as segregated as they are. And I think it's the reason that largely our lives are pretty segregated too. Because, let's, I mean, let's face it, we, typic, we, are, we tend to be most comfortable with people who are like us. Mm -hmm. uh, not only ethnically, um, but I think in terms of how we think. Um, and I think that it's, it's that latter part, you know, where I think where the diversity thing is really important. Because I think in our culture, I think our culture celebrates all kinds of diversity except for the most important kind, which is the diversity of thought. And, I mean, you can have a very diverse group of folks who all think the same way. Mm -hmm. And I think your diversity is largely wasted. Uh, so I try, to, I try to make it a point to be around people as often as I can who I know think differently than I do mm -hmm. about some of, the issue, some of the important issues of the day. Mm -hmm. I try, you know, I've, I've tried for a long time to have meaningful relationships with nonbelievers mm -hmm. who, just, who see the gospel and see the scripture really differently than I do. That's largely for evangelistic purposes, but it, it's really helpful for me to be on, in touch with what some of the most uh, so I guess some of the most compelling reasons not to believe are for unbelievers. Mm -hmm. So we can answer those. Uh, and so I would, I would I don't think that, you know, a church like this, that I think is largely homogeneous, has to decide to be ethnically diverse overnight or at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, just, it's at, at the least a recognition that God's kingdom includes a lot of people who don't look like me, mm -hmm. who don't worship like me, mm 
who don't think like I do, uh, who, see, who see my culture really differently because they're looking at it through a little different set of lenses. Mm -hmm. And they tend to see things that we don't see about ourselves. I mean, for example, you know, you go, it doesn't, I mean, you've been to Indonesia, you've been to other parts, you know, other parts of the world, you know, the developing world. It's not hard to come back from seeing places like that and see, wow, the consumerism that exists here is, is just off the charts. Uh, but it, I think it takes, you know, being exposed to a contrasting culture to be able to see that clearly. And I think, I actually think, I think actually think it's really helpful to read the scripture with people from other cultural backgrounds yeah. because they see things in the scripture that you and I might not. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So great. Anyway, I hope that's. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to be, you know, trying to be balanced about this sure. too, because um, I, I mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, I've I've seen too many examples of churches who think that they get the picture mm -hmm. and set out on this trek to become ethnically diverse and they do it in a way that's not well thought out and it just and it just goes mm -hmm. terribly off the rails. Mm -hmm. There have been way too many of those. Okay. So speaking of uh, being able to understand and get along with people from different perspectives, some of the questions that came through relate to uh, politics, which we're going to come up on Sunday. Uh, but no Q&A during that time, is, you know, when family members get together, they want to talk about, naturally, the election coming up in 40-plus days, just a little, a little over 40 Gosh, days. Gosh, is it that soon? It's amazing. Yikes. And, and yet, you know, when, when families or friends talk about it, you know, they're, they're, the discussions become polarized because different people are leaning in different yeah. ways. And so part of, many of the questions came from the perspective of, how do we approach that? How do we talk about the issues in a way that's beneficial, that could focus on the issues without essentially destroying relationships? Yeah. Well, I think if it, if it, were, if it were true that you know, we were just leaning mm -hmm. one way or another, we'd have an easier time of it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think we're not just leaning, I think we're firmly entrenched. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, it's like the, the road on the Alaskan highway says, choose your rut carefully. You're going to be in it for the next 200 miles. Mm -hmm. And I think we've, a lot of our political entrenchments feel like ruts mm -hmm. like that. Uh, or as, as our mentor put it, a hardening of the categories. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I guess my, my first bit of advice would be to say to listen. Mm -hmm. And to listen without judgment, without assessment. Listen in order to understand. And we have, we have a rule that we like to do at, around the university that, is, that essentially says you, you don't critique anyone until you have listened enough and understand their position sufficiently so that you can repeat it back to them to their satisfaction so that you make sure that you're actually representing and you actually understand what yeah. they hold. And that takes a lot of listening. Yeah. Really oh, and that's, and that's, I think the, that's why the Bible calls us to be quick to listen and mm -hmm. so to speak, slow to speak. I mean, in election season, that's especially true. Um, and I think the, the other thing that I think is that we often do this, maybe not directly, but indirectly, mm -hmm. through our tone of voice or our body language or our facial expressions, is we equate certain positions with, for lack of a better term, evil mm -hmm. or being an idiot. Um, and that, you know, that's part of the polarization of our culture, that we view people who disagree with us as evil or as moronic, as, mm. or as stupid, mm. uh, which if you want to have a conversation, that's, that's the last way I'd recommend to, to get that started. Um, and I, yeah, I, I mean, I think people, I think people, you know, I hold the views that I do because I think they're right. Mm. 
But I'm open to the possibility that on some of these things, I might be wrong. I mean, there, you know, somebody may, you know, have a passage of scripture that I haven't thought about before. Somebody may have an argument that I have trouble answering. Here's the other thing we suggest for people to do is you, you, you ought to be able to articulate where your own view is vulnerable. You know, what's the best argument against your view? Because that way I know that you've taken some time and effort to understand the views that you disagree with. If we, you know, if we could agree to disagree civilly on some things, we would be way far ahead. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some things that really are evil. I mean, I think, in my view, people who are sort of unabashedly uh, in favor of abortion on demand throughout all nine months of pregnancy are fostering an evil. I think people who think that human trafficking is an acceptable practice are fostering an evil. But I don't think the person who holds that view is evil. And that's a big difference. So if, I think... I would encourage, and I know some of these conversations are between parents and children. Mm -hmm. And parents need to step out of parenting mode when having discussions on this with their mm -hmm. children. Treat your children like adults um, and give, give their views the respect that they deserve. Yeah, that's good. So also connected with the whole decision-making process for us as voters, you know, when it comes to selecting a president or voting on propositions. Some of the questions also related to what are the, the, the principles or the values, the driving factors that should really guide our decisions because sometimes there's not a clear answer. Yeah. Right. So yeah. How, do, how do we make those choices? Well, for, for one, I guess I'd want to say one of the things I try not to do. I try not to shoehorn scripture into every mm. proposition. Because it, do, it doesn't fit in every one. Some of the, like mo most of our propositions, I think the Bible doesn't directly address. Mm -hmm. And there may, be, there may be things that, you know, it speaks to by way of application or tangentially. Um, one, of the, one of the things I try to think about is how will this affect the poorest of the poor? Mm -hmm. uh, will they be adversely affected? Um, because I, I think I think I do think the scripture has special attention mm -hmm. to you know the well-being of the least among us, mm -hmm. and then I think that, I think it's also in places where the Bible doesn't speak to it directly. I think we just we use prudential considerations. Mm -hmm. You know what are what what's this going to do to our communities? What good will it produce? What are the what are the harms that it might produce? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I try, to, on some of these, I, I try to use what I, what I would refer to as common sense economics mm -hmm. uh, on some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's okay, you know, to have your self-interest, mm -hmm. you know, be a factor. You know, I wouldn't vote entirely on my self-interest. I'd like to mm -hmm. think that I'm a little more principled than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that that's, that's not inappropriate to bring your self-interest to bear mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So another person wondered, how much does character have to do with our choice of a candidate? This is a setup. <laughs> <laughs> um, I th in general, I think character matters to leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and I get, and my, I guess. However you come down on this, how you vote, I would encourage you to be consistent on this. Because for, for my friends who are more on the left politically, who generally tended to give Bill Clinton a pass on character because they liked his policies, I'm, I'm, I'm saying to them, be careful that you treat Donald Trump the same way. And for, the, and for my friends on the right who want to do that for the president, you know, they were typically the ones who were crucifying Bill Clinton for his character flaws. Mm 
And I say, you, neither of you are being consistent on this. So either character matters or it doesn't. And I think probably for the average person, um, it may matter a little bit less. But I, I, want, I often wonder, you know, with, with, some, with some of the presidents who had, I mean, and, and, you know, Clinton and Trump are not the only presidents who have had grave character flaws. Mm -hmm. But I wonder what some of the people closest to them thought about their ability to lead mm -hmm. as a result of these character flaws. I wonder what mm -hmm. the White House staff thought or what the Secret Service thinks mm -hmm. about these character flaws. Mm -hmm. I'd want to be really careful that we don't get to a place where we say that character is irrelevant. Because mm. I don't think that's true. And I don't think most of us believe that when it comes to leadership in the organizations that we work in. Because if I can't trust the people I work with, how, how am I going to follow their leadership? Mm. That, I mean, that means everything mm -hmm. at that level. Yeah. Okay. So let's Did I effectively last... dodge that question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one last question is a couple people wrote in and they asked about, you know, with the L.A. County health mandate for like no gatherings in churches at this point, and, and yet we see what's happening with Grace Community, John MacArthur, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, and, and then we think of Romans 13, 1 and 2, mm -hmm. uh, just to obey government authorities. So what are your, what's your perspective on that? And, you know, who makes that call? Is it the government? Is it the leaders in the church? Or how do we work together? Yeah, this was, I had a lot of fun with this because I actually got, got asked to be on NBC. I was on the news on this mm -hmm. just after the, this all came to the surface. Um, but the state of California is not telling churches that they can't meet. Mm -hmm. They're telling them they can't meet in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Now, if the state of California was shutting off your internet access uh, so you couldn't live stream, you know, then we've, you've, we've got a point. But this, this is, I, I would not consider this a case of a conflict between the law of God and the law of the land. Because what I don't believe what government is asking churches to do actually violates any part of Scripture. Because mm. they're not telling you that you can't meet at all. They're telling you that you have to meet in a way that's consistent with public safety mm. at the moment. Um, and and even, I mean, even if there were a conflict, and, and the, uh, you know, the Bible's clear that the obligation to obey civil government is not an absolute absolute. That there are times, as the apostles put it, we must obey God rather than men. I don't think this is actually one of those, or at least it's not yet to that place. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think government is within its rights to protect public health, to restrict gatherings, as long as they do it consistently. Mm -hmm. Now, if they single out churches, mm -hmm. you know, if they, if they allow you know, football stadiums to be filled, but don't allow churches to be filled, then that's discrimination based on religion. And that's mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, but I don't get the sense that that's being done today. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think you can probably raise a question, you know, the, the, the racial protests. Uh, I'm not sure there was a lot of social distancing that went on with many of those. Uh, but I'd say government had its hands full enforcing mm -hmm. Lots of different things. I don't think social distancing was mm. quite at the top of the list of priorities that they were trying to enforce. Mm. So what's, what's your take with um, 3,000 meeting in the sanctuary of Grace Community Church? I mean, do you think that's, like, like if, if John MacArthur were to call you up and say, hey, Dr. Ray, you know, what, 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 what's your perspective on, on our gathering uh, week in, week out? What would you say? I'd say... I'd say don't do it until the state says that it's safe to do so. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, my opinion mm -hmm. about whether it's safe does not trump the opinion of county health officials in the CDC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, if, I mean, even, even if I believe that it was overblown, which I don't, mm -hmm. um, I'd say that's irrelevant. Yeah. Okay. 
You know, another question came up, just thinking out loud and thinking about our topic of race and racism. And I think this is a, a good way to maybe even pray that God would give us a greater understanding and ability to listen and to uh, be engaged with people that are different than us culturally, experientially, just our own worlds. You know, when you look at a church, you know, like ours, which is um, very monolithic in many ways and economically, ethnically, lifestyle-wise, what are some of the ways that we could expand our ability to, uh, I think, not only be more understanding, but more empathetic and caring and even engaged? I think it probably starts at the individual relational mm -hmm. level. Uh, and I would, you know, I would, I would encourage all of us to, you know, do better than we have mm. uh, at at establishing just a handful. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe the goal is in the next year, have a relationship with one person mm. who is of a different, who's of, say, of a minority ethnicity, mm -hmm. uh, dif different than your own. Mm -hmm. I, because my guess is if we don't start there, you know, we'll go another year. Mm. And at, at the least, we'll have we'll at least have have one meaningful relationship. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I think that just is you know, it's just as conversations mm -hmm. and coffee, and you know, eventually, you know, I, I mean, I was challenged on this not long ago. You know, I I like I'd like to think that I have meaningful relationships with several mm -hmm. folks from other ethnicities. And the person asked me, I said, so when the la when's the last time you had one of them in your home? Mm -hmm. And I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's that that mm -hmm. that's telling. Yeah. Um, so that that would be one. And then I think the, the other thing I think just 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 theologically, and this is actually has I think has apologetic value mm -hmm. too. That uh, it's been it's very common among secular, um, you know, black and Latino activists, for example. To refer to Christianity as the white man's religion, hmm. which in reality in church history is nothing of the sort, because you know, as, as you know, almost all of our, you know, core theological traditions hmm. emerged out of the Middle East and North Africa, hmm. and then they migrated to Europe, and so there, there really is there's a very real sense in which Christianity had its most basic roots, obviously in the Middle East, but its mm. theological development really came from North Africa. Mm. You know, Augustine was from Carthage. Mm. Athanasius was from Thrace in North Africa. Uh, and, and a handful of, of the, mm. the, the stalwart theologians that established our tradition that we all mm. hold to today in the, in the creeds mm. came sort of fundamentally from North Africa. So I... I, I'm, try, I'm trying to go back and read some of those great theologians mm -hmm. who were African, who informed a lot of our, our theological traditions. Mm -hmm. those, those would be maybe a couple places to start. Yeah, that's great. They're, mo they're modest starts, but at least I think they're starts. Okay, great. Well, thanks for not only sharing tonight, but also engaging back and forth oh, with I, the questions. Is, the, que the questions are the fun part. You, yeah. all, you all have great questions. So we'll pick I'm up very more. appreciative of that. Yeah, so some of the other questions that came in, we'll pick those up tomorrow morning as well. And so maybe, Dr. Ray, could you lead us in prayer? Then I Alex would. and Kev will lead us in a yeah. final song. Lord, we're so grateful for our opportunity to be together tonight uh, from the comfort of our homes. Uh, and Lord, you know, we've had long weeks, and uh, we're grateful for people who have come to this to be stretched and challenged. Uh, and to learn a little bit more about some of these issues from the perspective of your word. Keep us biblically grounded uh, and theologically centered as we continue to approach these in a spirit of graciousness and winsomeness. Uh, may we hold our convictions well, but also hold them graciously, kindly, and lovingly. We ask all this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.